All right, so we are kicking off our ball striking series with Tony Ruggiero, uh, Tour Coach Podcast. Tony, um, you oh. are a ball striking aficionado, I feel like. Um, I'm, I think I'm fortunate. I've got a bunch of guys that hit it pretty good. It makes me look better. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think that uh, – I think this, I think – some of the stuff that in the way we teach probably, you know, uh, probably helps that. Right. Um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate that, uh, the, some of the people I've taught from even from high school up and developing into tour players, they've been good ball strikers. It's been their strength. So I think it's probably a combination of some of the stuff we do and, and the fact that they're really gifted and talented is probably more of it, but yeah. What does a good ball striker mean? Let's just start there. Like what, how do we define that? I think there's lots of ways you could define it. Um, I think one, I th these are the ways I look at it. One, contact. To me, great ball strikers always find us, and really good ball strikers hit it in the center of the face. And then and the one thing that's incredibly important for me for teaching players at higher levels is to me, the better ball strikers might hit it a little right or hit it a little left, but their distance is almost always exactly what they want it you know, uh, and they know exactly how far the ball is going to go. So I think great ball strikers have, are by what you mean by a great ball striker is that they have real control of their golf ball with contact, great contact, consistent contact, and the ability to control the distances. I think everybody misses it a little right, a little left, but they always, they always control distances really well. Interesting. Interesting. So quality of strike. Mm -hmm. um, center face contact. Do you do a lot of like foot spray then on like stuff and tests or how do you do, how do you train center? So I, I don't, um, now I don't use the foot spray. I know lots of guys do. I've just, it's just never been my deal. Probably just too lazy to get up off the chair and go spray it. Uh, but you know, one of the reasons like the quad and the foresight, one of the reasons I got interested in that early on was because you could see exactly where it hit on the face. And I know we're talking about launch monitors and I thought that, so I thought it was more easy to explain misses because of where you saw it on the face. So that was one of the reasons that they, so like if I'm worried about contact, that's probably more where I go with that. Gotcha. So great ball strikers uh, make great contact. They hit the center of the face a lot that means their distance control is good. They might miss a little right or left. Mm -hmm. um, when you think of great ball strikers, do you think of someone who can work the ball both ways? Someone, you know, like Lucas, where it's everything's right to left. Like, does shot shape matter to you when you think ball striking? No. I mean, I, you know, I don't. I think that, uh, you know, I think all of them can, all great ball strikers can on, when they have to curve it a certain direction, right? And we, we mentioned Lucas. I mean, he can hold it against the wind, curve it left to right if he needs to, certainly not his preference. And I think, to be honest, he would tell you that he's gotten better at that in the last three or four years. You've hung out around a summit, Frederica, and stuff where, like, at times he almost gets pissed that it's easier for him to hit a fade than it is sometimes to draw. Um, but – you know, I think all I think all really good ball strikers can curve it if they have to, but I, I don't. I don't. There to me, and I know there's exceptions. There's very few that are that do it a lot both ways. I think they have a preferred shot shape, and you know, now they may be different for off the tee and with irons, uh, but um, I think they have a shot that they that's repeatable. I think repeatable is the key. They it comes out the same window. Um, same who comes shape. to mind when, when you walk a range on tour, like who comes to mind is, is that persona? Well, I mean, I think Lucas is, I mean, not just cause I coach him, but I think he's one of the best ball strikers out there. Right. Um, you know, uh, let me, guys, that, you know, I thought when, when he played really good golf, this is going back, but these are guys I coached. I thought when he had that stretch where he played really good, I thought Smiley Kaufman was a really good ball striker, a really controlled his iron distances and curved it one way, uh, left to right for the most part, you know, um, and that would go into the, where if you, you start curving it both ways, I think that's where guys have it to trying to do that sometimes get off track. So, um, you know, shoot, there's, I mean, 
uh, trying to think who you walk up and down. I mean, like I can remember standing at a U.S. Open next to Dustin Johnson and listening to him hit it, and it sounds different. Like it's good, <laughs> right? You know, uh, DJ is always impressive. You know, uh, irons and wedges to me one of the the best wedge player, and it's so fun to watch him hit irons. And it's so pure as Justin Thomas. And uh, I love watching him hit wedges and not scoring clubs. Like I think everybody talks about his footwork, right? Like with the drivers, they show those pictures of his feet in the air. But you watch him hit a scoring club, how beautiful his footwork is, how great his rhythm is, and how solid and how good the contact is and how his distance control is phenomenal with his scoring clubs. Interesting. Interesting. Well, so you mentioned the word consistency, right? When we talk about ball striking, I'm sure that you've probably heard 80% of people walk into your (laughs) studio and say, Hey, I want to be more consistent. Um, How do you, what's your answer to that? How do you negotiate that word? Um, I struggle with that word because I feel like it's, I mean, I don't know if consistency is a thing um, personally, but I think consistent. I mean, I think some people that come in are consistently, they consistently suck. Yeah. Right. (laughs) You know, I mean, consistency doesn't necessarily mean good. You're good. Right. I think, but I, I think there's a couple things and, and, you know, I know you've done tons of stuff with Greg Carton, right. But like the whole, I think once you, once you understand that golf's really hard and that I think by nature it's inconsistent and that there are lots of ups and downs, you're probably set up to become a better player. But I I think that, uh, I think that most golfers, what they really mean when they come to you and they say they want to be more consistent is that they want a more repeatable shot pattern. They don't want to be trying to draw it and all of a sudden hit a huge right shot and then a big left shot. I think that's what really golfers are looking for. And so when they, when they come and they say that they want to be more consistent, I think they want, they don't want misses that go both directions. Um, And I think they want to understand what's causing their bad shots. I think so many golfers out there struggle because they, you know, they don't understand what's causing their bad shots. And I think this is a real key and I, and I tell our junior golfers this all the time that one of the great things I think about tour players and the best players in the world is that they understand what it is they need to do to hit their good shot. I don't, I think they're way less concerned with other stuff, other people and all that, but they have a real understanding of what it is they need to do to hit their good shot. I think, you know, uh, recreational golfers, the weekend warrior, I think they're always worried about like, well, what made it go left? What made it go right? And they don't ever have a basic understanding of what it is they do when they do it good. I think if you understand what it is you do when you hit your good shot, you've got a better chance to repeat it. And the more you can repeat something by nature, I think you're going to be more consistent. For me, I've always found like when you understand dispersion pattern, the first Mm -hmm. time somebody sees that, right? Right. Um, Me hitting an eight iron versus Lucas hitting an eight iron. 10 shots, then looking at the dispersion pattern is going to be drastically different, right? For sure. That's Mm -hmm. consistency in one form is, well, we're all going to hit, we're not going to hit in the same spot, no matter how good you are. Um, But his pattern is going to be way tighter over 10 shots than mine. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and that's consistency is, is just knowing that, Hey, it could go anywhere in here. Um, I I'm just not that good. So my, my window of tolerance is way bigger than, you know, someone else right right and that's you know if you look at like i mean all the stats and those types of systems out there and the cone and i you know obviously one that on social media a bunch of people uses that decade but like mm-hmm. you know knowing how to aim your cone right the biggest you know mac barnhart and i always sit down with learning center and talk about like knowing your variants mm-hmm. I mean, you know you got to know how far right you can miss it and how far left you can miss it and if you can do that you can play golf and aim and i think like what you just said is so your boundaries are wider Mm -hmm. than Lucas Glover or Robbie Shelton or Zach Sucker or Rick Lamb or whoever. Right. And so I think all we're doing when we coach and teach is helping people understand what makes those boundaries get wider so that they can bring them in and that their shot dispersion is is less. Well, let's talk launch miners. Let's get 
specific mm-hmm. when we're trying to tighten, um, you know, that cone, um, you know, what metrics are most important to you? What, what data are, are you looking at? Like, what, what are some of your top numbers that you think are, are most important? Um, path and face. You know, to me, the bigger the difference between the path and face, like, you know, I, like I think, you know, if a guy wants to draw at his path and, and his face, you know, his path's got to be into out. I don't think you, I think, but the more into out it goes, the more you're going to have to have the face closed to that path. So I, I try to have less variances now. Like I don't, I, I try to get people, I'm not a big zero and out guy, like where you want it to be zero. But I think like, you know, you, when you get people with paths that are way left with faces that are way open, I think that you get more, you know, you get more variances in there. If you get way into out with a face that's shutting, uh, having to shut uh, a lot more to the path, I think there's more, you know, there's going to be more curve, you know, more variances in there. So I try to, I'm always looking at, path and and face on that you know contact for me is a lot of pivot work right I think if you get people like um, you get recreational golfers and they and they don't you know they hit behind it they hit it fat they hit it thin all that I think a lot of that stuff can be very much pivot related and not enough either not enough pivot back but especially not enough pivot through the ball interesting so let's say you see someone's path they typically are three to the three to the right, but you see them now going back the other way and it's maybe more towards zero, or even the other way, you'll look at their pivot first and see if maybe they're, they're not making a, a, ba- a full backswing or full pivot back. Or is that kind of how you think about well, yeah, that? I mean, you know, I, I think every, every player is different. Right. And so the art of coaching is looking at a guy and, and, uh, uh, Bade and Schaff and I were talking last night about like, you know, when you have a live lesson in front of you, you got like a minute or two to kind of summarize it in your head and say, Hey, this is what, what, where we're going to start. Um, and look, sometimes I start with somebody and then I'm like 15 minutes into it. Like uh, that isn't the right way. I mean, so as you know, I'm super simple. So if, if I'm trying to get somebody's path less into out or less out to in, I mean, I like to do things with them real simple to let them coach themselves a little. I like to put a, you know, I've used the rope a bunch. You've seen me use the rope for the target line, have them tee the ball up on the target line and put a stick out there directly between them and the target and let them, I mean, a great drill for anybody is to learn to start it right and curve it left, start it left and curve it right and let them figure out how much of each they need to do to hit whatever shot shape they were. You know, I think a lot of folks can, can, I mean, we're, we're making an assumption here that they've got good grips. They've got a pretty good club face, those types of the good posture and set up ball in the right spot. But like, I think a lot of people can figure some of this stuff out on their own if they go out there and they try to curve it right to left and they try to curve it left to right with understanding that to draw it, it's got to, the path has to be more into out and it to curve it, the face has to be close to that path and if they want to cut it it's the opposite and go out there and you know uh, I'm big on exaggerating I mean sometimes when a guy really wants to draw it I'll have them just hit snap hooks and then I'll say you know all right now hit a big slice now try to hit one in the middle doing that and I think if you do that I think you know I think a lot of people can coach themselves figure things out on themselves without us having to fill them with a bunch of information. It's, it's key. I mean, too many people get so stuck or so concerned about, I've got to stay, you know, if my path is here and that's where I want it to be, I, I got to right. stay as close to that as I can right. every single golf shot, you know, all the time. Cause I got to, you know, ingrain that mm-hmm. feeling and they miss this part of this awareness so that they can self coach almost. Right. right. Mm Because if you see something happening on the course or when you're out practicing and you have no awareness of what it feels like when your path goes to the left or to the right or what these things are, you can't can't help yourself, which is I think the best part about launch monitors is feedback. Right. Um, uh, I think that. So if you do one correct, you hit your shot, whatever it is, whatever your perfect shot is. 
I'll have guys say, you know, Lucas has said this, Robbie said, like, I just want to hit that shot every time. That's, that's the one I want. Well, then you can look down and say exactly what was that path. Right. Uh, and I think that going even deeper, like with things like swing catalyst, then you can say, okay, how much did they turn? Where was the pressure? All of those things, you know, um, I shift path a lot with pressure trace, right? Like, so I, I, I have probably had, I mean, I probably use that as much trying to change path with some people and especially better players, uh, as I, as, as I do anything, you know, so I'll, I may work with them on the swing catalyst and we may, you know, you see a guy trying to hit a draw, but the pressure, he gets it out on the toes going back and it goes too quick to the left heel. I mean, he probably doesn't have a very good chance to hit a draw. So helping him understand where the pressure and weight and all that stuff needs to go can help a guy. And then you put him on the rope and you put a stick out there and have him try to do that and get it to start it right to left. Or, you know, if he's getting way into his heel and running out onto his left toe and he wants to fade it, that's not going to work either. Uh, so helping helping folks understand the relationship between that pressure trace and how the body's working along with what the path and the face need to be. I think if we can educate them, educate the golfer with that and then let them figure it out a little bit. I think they got a better chance to do it on the golf course and a better chance to own it. If they figure a little bit of it out themselves. So do you use, you're using a launch monitor as like finding the symptom and then you try to look to what's causing that. Is that a little bit how you use it? Well, I mean, you know, we're always trying to find the cause, right? Yeah. The cancer or the main thing. So, um, I mean, I look at all of the stuff. I mean, real a lot of it's my eyes. Yeah. Uh, I use, you know, when I film a guy and he comes into Frederica and he hits, I watch him hit. And I like to watch somebody hit too when they're out warming up without me being there because they're not trying to do what they think I would want to do. <laughs> and you can watch them just hitting balls uh, and you can watch everything how much time do they take between hitting balls, everything. So I like to do that. And then, you know, so that's the first part of the analysis. Um, then I, and I think then it's obviously the interviewing of asking them questions about what they're working on. What's the bad shot when they play their best, what, what do they do? But then I think there's also, but then I like to film them and I like to look at the track man, the quad data and the swing catalyst data together and figure out like, I mean, is it just they're swinging a little too much out to the right or or to the left? Or is it because their pivot isn't where I don't think it's a concrete set thing like you always start. I think you have to look at all of the information, trust your intuition, have, so, you know, and, and I rely a lot on experiences from other players things that have worked, things that didn't work, things I've seen people do. Uh, and I rely a lot on things I've learned from observing and watching other great teachers from all my time with Hank Johnson and Mark Wood, Wayne Flint, the times I've gone to watch Butch twice, I think it was. And, you know, you talk with Billy Harmon, like all of those things, Brady Riggs, like, you know, you try to pick up little tidbits each time that may help you when you get a certain, uh, you know, something, uh, you know, you, when you get a certain situation, I think the key is that there's no set rules. Yeah. Like we're trying to find the cause, but I don't know that always start in a certain place necessarily gets, gets you there. I think you want to get as much information about the student as you can. And then you want to look at as much information as you can in a short time frame and make your assessment. Yep. Um, talking, talking launch monitors here. Um, how do tour pros use launch monitor data or what's, what's the regular kind of process? Every, with every, you know, you got a lot of these younger guys that have grown up with them, right. That get delve, I think delve way more into some of the information and uh, than other players. Um, I think the if I was to say that, you know, they look the, the most common things you hear on a range would be, you know, I think your mid to older guys are using a lot of it for distance. I think during a tournament week, the majority of players are using it to know how far the ball's going, where they are. I think that's the number one thing players are, are doing and they want it to be accurate uh, and they want it to be easy to set up. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so I think that's number one across the board. Most of the time, if I'm walking down the range and I'm asking like, you know, somebody's airing us, which you'll say, Hey, what you doing? And I'll just check in my numbers, just checking how far it's going. So I think that's number one. And then I think you have guys that monitor their path and their face and their attack, you know, uh, attack angle, like guys may not like it getting steep or, or vice versa. So, but I, you know, as a rule, I think, the more information that the guys use it for probably transpires to being more of a younger player that's grown up with it. How much does distance and ball speed and club head speed change week to week or month to month? I think distance changes a pretty good bit based on um, where they are, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, especially on the PGA tour, you know, they're going to go from, so they're going to go from Palm Springs and when it's uh you know, it's warm in the afternoon, super dry, ball goes a long way. But in the morning, they'll hit balls on a track man or a quad or rap soda or whatever it is they're using to know, like, man, if if I get that 7.30 tee time, first six holes, ball's not going anywhere. I need to know how far it's not, you know, how much less it's it's going. And then you go from there and, you know, so the ball's going a long way. And then you're going, and then you go a few weeks, you go up to Pebble Beach where, I mean, Pebble Beach in February is not always the most pleasant weather, right? And the ball isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and they need to, and they need to know how much it's not going anywhere. So, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of variation in distance, and I, and I, I also think that from a golfer listening to me and you, I don't think very nearly, very many golfers. I think they say, I if you ask them, I hit how far you hit your seven. I hit 160 yards. I don't think very many folks know whether that's carry or total, and the difference between hitting their seven iron 160 yards in July versus February. And I, and I mean, I see it all the time. Junior golfers are the worst. I mean, it's they got 160 and it's 48 degrees, and they pull their seven iron out, and then they think they're not hitting it any good because it comes up 15 yards short in a bunker. Right. I mean, it's not their golf swing, it's the condition. So I think um, tour players take so much time and effort to know exactly how far the ball is going. Uh, using devices, whether it's any of those monitors yeah. or it's or it's shooting a tree out on the range and hitting a ball at it and seeing where it goes. Right. There's lots of different ways to do it. And you don't have to have a launch monitor if you're listening to us to be able to figure that out. So uh, but I think that every golfer could benefit from understanding that how far you hit your seven iron, how far you hit your pitching wedge, whatever it is, is going to change daily, weekly, monthly based on conditions, you know, and sometimes too, distance going down under good uh, conditions is an indication that, Hey, maybe I'm not, my pivot's not working as good as I need it to be or something's off. Right. Uh, It gives us, I always feel like, or, or physically, my back's not moving as good. My hips aren't turning as good, whatever. And it lets us go, okay, well, you need to go do some stuff with Colby in the gym because your hips aren't moving enough because you're not carrying it quite as much. Far. I mean, are you watching club head speed and ball speed as well? Or are you just looking at distance numbers? Yeah, I mean, I watch a little bit of club head speed and ball yeah. speed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like a junkie. Like, I mean, there's some guys that's all they focus on. Right. And there's great teachers that that's what they're always looking at. I mean, I think it's incredibly important now, and I've got some young guys, uh, young kid Justin Burroughs that hammers it, right? I got some young guys that hammer it, but um, I mean, I'm more like, is the ball going where they want it to go and the distance they're trying to hit it? I think in the end, that's the most important part for making a living. Mm-hmm. Hey, I think most of those guys hit it far enough, like driver distances is key, right? But like, are they hitting it? Yeah, most of those guys hit it far enough now. Yep. Hey, have you ever found that someone has like, hey, your club at speed is down a little bit here this week? Like, what what's up? Do we have a physical like is something going on? Yeah, I mean, at, yeah, at the U.S. Open at Shinnecock, not at Shinnecock, at the U.S. Open at Wingfoot, yeah. um, Lucas was not hitting it well on Monday, Tuesday, Monday in particular. Ball wasn't going as far. Um, not just as far, but it wasn't like it wasn't starting online, this, that, and the other. And, you know, I was asking to do the things we've been doing and it turned out, I mean, shoot, it was more physical. He'd flown across country to get there. 
hips weren't moving. He did a bunch of work with Colby every night getting treatment. And, he, you know, he finished 15th, 17th or something in the U.S. Open and was way up there in ball striking through, you know, through 54 holes. So, yeah, I, th- I mean, I, I think with really good players, it's more likely something physical than it is just something totally going wrong in their golf swing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, what kind of tolerance should I give myself, right? If I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some, do some testing, I, I want to find out some distances. Um, like what, what should I be looking for with distance? So let's say I'm hitting an eight iron and it goes, I hit one, you know, 155 and then I hit one, 168 and then I hit one, 160. Like what kind of ranges do you like to see? Cause I know a lot of people see really big ranges, right. Mm-hmm. Of Yeah they're not good ball strikers. So they hit one a little fat and it goes 150 and then they pure one and it goes 168. And then they're like, Oh shit. How, you know, yeah, like, what, so what's going that, on? How far do I hit this thing? So that's where I think one, you got to get, you got to work on contact. What's in your golf swing, not giving you consistent contact or the same contact every time. And you know, another thing too, I mean, and not like I'm not a huge fitting geek, but some of the equipment out there that's built to help the recreational golfer hit it further isn't as consistent with how far the ball flies, right? I mean, ball jumps more, comes out without spin, those types of things. I mean, I find that, um, uh, you know, I went through this phase where this is funny. I mean, like I was playing a little bit, this was a couple, a few years back, and I decided to order some irons that were stronger and had light graphite shafts because I wanted to hit it further, right? Well, hell, I mean, you know, I normally hit my wedge 130. I mean, I flew a green with a wedge. It went like 150. And then the next time it went 135 because like, you know, that wasn't, you know, so like that's great for a guy that's 65 or 70 that, or 55 that needs a bunch of distance. But I think also there's trade-offs when you do some of those things fitting wise that give you the opportunity to have some distance. You also have to understand that a lot of times I think you're giving up some distance control that the hot one could be in there. Let's, let's end with this. So let's say I, I want to take some of those tactics that tour pros are using, getting my yardages in check. Mm-hmm. What's kind of your process for that? How many balls do I need to hit? Do I throw out ones that I hit badly? Like, how do I figure out, give us a practical step that I can go do to kind of figure out how to dial in my distances a little bit if I want to. Well, I think one thing is you want to do it in a minimum number of balls. I see folks hit a shitload of balls and they're, you know, then they get to the five iron and they've hit 70 balls and they're tired. And I don't think those numbers are very accurate. And I think the same thing happens with driver fitting and driver testing. And I've seen that on tour guys are, you know, they, whatever, a driver isn't going well, or their driver's non-conform, whatever. And they hit three bags of balls. I mean, I don't know that you're getting very accurate data after you've hit three bags of balls, right? Cause you're fatigued and you never do that on a golf course. I mean, when do you hit, 10 drivers in a row on the golf course. You don't ever do it. So I think the less number of balls you could do it. And so uh, I like to do what I just tell folks that come to see me, and you know, obviously there's, you know, these launch monitors, which are fantastic, but I think one key would be to do it in less balls, hit three, four balls with each club and you, you throw, know, you, you throw out the bad ones. Like if, if yeah, I, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I would want to know how far do I hit my two or three average shots? Like that's a good one. That's pretty average. It's good. And know what those are. I mean, if I chunk one, I don't know that that helps you a whole lot. Right. Yeah. You know? I mean, uh, you're not, I mean, you're not clubbing yourself based on the aspect or the prospect that you could chunk one 50 yards. So I'm going to club up six clubs in case I chunk it. So, um, you know, I think you want to know what your average. I always ask folks like, hey, is that what you would call a pretty good one? If you hit that on the golf course, would you be pretty happy with it? And they'll be like, yeah, that was pretty good. Okay, well, that went 156. Mm-hmm. Let's call it 156. You hit these other two and it went 152 and 159. So, I mean, that's my variation. And I think it's different based on people. So I, I try to do it with fewer balls, get them to be honest and tell me, would like if you hit it on the golf course, would be pretty happy with it. And then also, I mean, I'll tell folks like, why don't you run out on the golf course or you're practicing and go to a par three where you, you know, and shoot the yardage and hit a sleeve of balls. 
go up there and see where they land and then mark it, you know, and just walk off the distance difference from what the, the pin that you shot. I mean, I think doing some stuff real life on the golf course may give you better data or real game time situation stuff of what's happening. Cause there's bunkers there, there's water there, there's yeah. wind, you know, and you can factor that stuff in. Last thing before we go, I remember one more. I, I've been trying to do some training with like launch angle, mm-hmm. trying to hit windows and try to be consistent. There's that word again mm-hmm. uh, with that. Yeah. I found that super challenging. I, I'm curious your thoughts on kind of like trying it's, to control launch angle and stuff. Because I think that most golfers aren't very consistent with what their impact position is, right? You know, with the shaft lean and, you know, and there's all different thoughts about how much of it's good and all that stuff. But I think you've got to, again, go back to contact, getting the low point to be consistent and getting your impact position, whatever is ideal for you. And you and your teacher can figure that out and argue about it with other teachers, whatever that needs to be. But you need to be getting close to the same, the low point in the same spot and the same impact conditions more of the time. And then you can hit windows. That's why tour players are good. Their impact conditions and positions are very much the same throughout the bag and throughout the shot. So they can control how the ball comes out. But if you're if you don't have a good pivot and you don't get the club to the same low point and the shaft's not at the same position each time, I mean you're probably not going to have the ball come out the same window every time. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I found it. I mean, it's it's very. It's hard. That That's hard. Like that. Yeah. For sure. That's right. That. It's also one of the harder things to teach young players is like, I mean, to learn to hit windows because they got to get better at certain things in their golf swing to do. Yep. Tony, thanks for hanging awesome, out. Awesome, Cordy. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it as always. Look forward to talking to you soon. Sounds good, man. Thanks.